Coming up this week on Kings of the Rings podcast, if you like flamethrowers, people getting hung by their feet, a vehicular manslaughter, and people getting crowned king and queen in a place where it's kind of royalty and a lot of political propaganda, this might be the show for you to tune into. King Ricky's here. I've got a will, but not the will that you think. It is a grayer will coming from Bot Spots in Share Shots Podcast. We are going to break down the anarchy, the chaos, the crownings that were this past weekend in the world of professional wrestling. Summer's here and it got really hot, so hot that a babyface tried to set somebody else on fire. All of that and more on episode 377 of Kings of the Rings podcast exclusively here on Wrestle Addict Radio and it starts right now. You know, it's really funny. I thought the messiest thing in the world of pro wrestling was when a babyface was about to set somebody else up on fire. And then the ending of Raw happened and it became really messy in the world of pro wrestling. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kings of the Rings podcast, episode number 377. I am your host, King Ricky Rose. Thank you guys for joining us, especially if you're watching us live right now on Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube. If you like what you're seeing, or if you end up liking what you're listening to, because I know you do, because listen to my voice, listen to this, okay? Make sure you like, share, subscribe, leave us five-star reviews, buy some of our fantastic merch. The links to all of that are in the description below. With me this week, no K, K is, K is still looking for for you. Uh, no, Mr. Mr. Tarashock is out in Austin, Texas. Yes, V Austin, Texas, uh, looking for a bleach blonde, bad built, butch body that he cannot find. Trust me on that. But I do have a little bit of a better consolation. He is a chef by trade, a mark by choice. He is the host of the Bot Spots and Chair Shots Wrestling Podcast, a part of Ribbit City Radio. I said Chef Boy Trade. I actually like Chef Boy Trade. I like that actually a lot. Um, that was totally a typo. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. <laughs> Will Gray. Will, how are you, sir? I am glad to be here, Ricky. You and I have seen a lot of each other this week. We have. Like Thursday for Trivia, Sunday for Botch Bots. I'm here with you tonight. Like, we're making this a regular routine, and I'm loving it. Yeah, no, it is you good. Know? It's good. I, I love a little integration. It's the summer of fun. Summer of fun right now. Uh, so, yeah, no, we we have a lot of interesting wrestling to talk about. It's going to be a lot of uh, freestyle in here right now, and that's just the way I like it. So let's get into some of the big news coming out of the world of pro wrestling. Uh, just a couple of just this weekend. The biggest thing that happened in the world of WWE is that Triple H again with pretty much a very it seems like they're creating a template for these big announcements for all of these major shows. Like you can look at the WrestleMania announcement and this announcement of SummerSlam uh, and they're literally the exact same thing with Different, completely different background music. Uh, but Triple H announced that Minnesota 2026 U.S. Bank Stadium, the home of the Vikings, is getting SummerSlam for two nights. The first ever two-night SummerSlam, August 1st and August 2nd, U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis. There have been a lot of thoughts about this event in general this is essentially on WrestleMania's calendar known as SummerSlam number two, SummerSlam, not SummerSlam, sorry, SummerSlam is known as WrestleMania number two, the WrestleMania of the summer, the WrestleMania with better weather, and yet they're putting it in an enclosed stadium in Minnesota, but like, I get it, it's Minnesota, anything can happen. Um, but it's two nights for the first time ever, and they're announcing it pretty much two years in advance uh, for this. So, we obviously know that Vegas is getting Mania next year, and we the reports for that is between Vegas and Minnesota for Mania. So Vegas got Mania next year, and it was presumed that it is potentially Minnesota for the year after that, but now that doesn't seem to be the case. Minnesota is getting something WrestleMania adjacent um, with SummerSlam and it being two nights, so it's theoretically going to be on the same par as WrestleMania that year. But is it necessary, Will Gray? I don't 
I don't know if it's necessary, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And here's why. Mm -hmm. If I were a betting man, Ricky, and uh, we talked about this on BotchBots. Not, no, it wasn't on BotchBots. I made a TikTok video about it. Mm. Sorry. Um, it was about the, the pay-per-views. And what I said was, if you look historically over the last 24 months, backlash in Puerto Rico, uh, EC in Australia. Australia, backlash in France. We've got money in the bank in Canada. Yeah. Last year we had money in the bank in England. You get where I'm going, where it seems like a lot of these non big four pay-per-views are going to the international audience, right? Yeah. So, and then you, all this, we get two Saudi shows a year, the India super show, like all of these big, they're going to Japan. And like, you get what I'm saying. Yeah. So in my brain, I go, okay, what happens if they take those six to seven, I'll call them the B tier pay-per-views, anything that isn't the big four. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Those call it eight events a year are all done overseas. Okay. Mm -hmm. What the states get are the big four all two nights. So the states Ooh. get eight big shows. Overseas gets eight big shows. Interesting. So you're so you're telling me that you think there's a potential that we are getting it, we're gonna get a two-night rumble a two-night Survivor Series, a two-night Mania, which we already have, and a two-night yep. SummerSlam, probably by 2030. I would say by 2030, if I were a betting man, the big four will be the only domestic shows in the States. They will all be two nights, and then the rest of the B-list pay-per-views will be in Canada and France and you know, scattered throughout. They've got working relationships in Japan now. Mm -hmm. They're doing super shows there. They've got super shows planned in South America, like Brazil and Mexico and mm -hmm. shit. Like, Still won't touch Africa. At, I don't know why yet. The Ugandan South, the what is it? The, the soft ground wrestling of Uganda has a really strong <laughs> foothold on that territory. That's true. Man, I don't think Mansoor, I don't Mansoor's think, bankrolling them. So, <laughs> I mean, they've got some money now. I don't yeah. think WWE's gonna, they're not gonna go to the territory. It's gonna be they hard to compete. It's gonna be hard uh -huh. to compete. They've, they've got that home city pop. You can't go over there and compete with them. But, <laughs> mosquitoes, <laughs> god damn it, Ty. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, I could see that being the case. And WWE, when you look at it, you're like, but would they do it? And then you look at the schedule now. They're already more than halfway there without saying anything about it. Yeah. Look at the – because we've still got Bash in Berlin. That's true. This year as well. Uh, we've got the India show later in the year. We've got one more Saudi show. We've still got money in the bank in Canada. Mm -hmm. like, And that that doesn't count. So we're going to have Fastlane and then the rest of the big four closing out the year. So SummerSlam, uh, Survivor Series, yep. and then a couple out of – so we're already more than halfway to what I said. And when you think about it, it would be a good even split. Eight shows domestically, eight big shows internationally. And then your house super shows and network specials. It's a good even blend. They would have 20 big shows a year on top of their 53 weeks of TV. And that's, you know, a special every six weeks or a, a pay-per-view every six weeks. That's absurd. I never thought of it that way. I mean, that logically makes sense. My only gripe with it is that I enjoyed WrestleMania being too nice. I think WrestleMania deserved to be two nights and that being the outlier I thought was perfect. Like this is the show up show. So the show up shows needs to stand on its own. <clears throat> and so I had, I, I kind of have some gripes initially with SummerSlam moving the two nights because I feel like, does that take away from the spectacle that is WrestleMania? And I, I had a conversation back and forth on our discord with my actual host, Will, uh, you know, with the logistics of, is this a downgrade for Minnesota? And that's when I, my thought process started to change. I was like, it's not a downgrade. You think of SummerSlam. SummerSlam is WrestleMania in the summer in disguise. So you're going to get a WrestleMania level show with a WrestleMania level production with better weather. And if, and if it's, even, if, even if it's not good weather, it's in a freaking domed arena. Okay. From a financial and purely capital, like capitalistic standpoint, 
this is a massive economic win for the for the state for the city of Minneapolis and the state of Minnesota. They're going to do WrestleMania numbers because, based on just signs alone, people move and are more active and travel more during the summertime. Location nonwithstanding. You're going to get people. You might not get maybe the international crowd. I I would beg to say you're going to get the international crowd because it's a major event. It's a big four. We're going to do crazy travel packages for it. And yes, it's also in the summer. People are more likely to to travel and go places in better weather. And we have the best weather right now. That's the herbs tilting in our direction. <laughs> you know, so so it's going to do wonders. I just. I have a concern. I was like, if every big four is two nights, what makes each one stand out from the other one? WrestleMania had that kind of had that pedestal against everybody because it was the only two night one with SummerSlam moving towards this. There's got you. There's going to be a, you got to be get a lot more creative with making these shows all seem different. They have to have their own identity. You're not wrong. And when you said the it's a spectacle unto itself, I don't think you're anywhere close to wrong with that statement. WrestleMania only stood on its own, though, for two years. No, for it was WrestleMania. Then the first Survivor Series was 86, something like that. 86 or 87. So maybe two years. We'll say a, a modest two years on its own before Survivor Series. Mm-hmm. So now you use that logic and you think, okay, 2020, one, two, three. This was the fifth WrestleMania that's two nights. I think now would be the perfect time to move one of the other big four to two nights mm-hmm. because WrestleMania was the biggest thing they had for two years and then they added to it. Now you think 40 years later, WrestleMania is the biggest thing they have. Now SummerSlam gets two nights. Next year they announce Rumble as two nights, and we get the men's Rumble one night and the women's Rumble one night. Yeah. And then by 2030, all four of the big four are now two nights. And it's like, it makes sense because they could make so much money internationally by moving those B-list pay-per-views overseas because France doesn't care that they got backlash. They showed out, they showed up, they blew the lid off the place. Backlash in Puerto Rico, I still think, was louder than France. It was. There's a lot of arguments for that. It absolutely was louder Uh, than France. I just think that's the case. And then you look at EC, even Australia, you know, like blew the lid off of that for Elimination Chamber. Mm -hmm. Like nobody's favorite pay-per-view is Elimination Chamber. And (laughs) Australia still treated it like a WrestleMania. Because it is their WrestleMania. Bingo. And that's the way they get treated. France treated it that way. England will treat it that way. Yep. Berlin will treat it that way. Tokyo won't give a fuck because they get the G1 and Wrestle Kingdom and, you know, Otaku and all of the stuff they've got going on over there. They're going to be <laughs> yeah. like, oh, cool. Whatever. We get to see Seth Rollins wrestle. Like, big deal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but you see my point. Yeah. Like, the rest of the world will make these feel like WrestleManias. And then we get, like, the four big ones here for us. Yeah. So AJ Hoover. Hey, AJ Hoover. Thanks for joining. Um, first Survivor Series was in 87. Perfect. So two full years then. Yeah, yeah. Two full years or so. Uh, and it, it makes sense. I think SummerSlam might be the best one to start with because SummerSlam has the has the least identity of any of the other big fours. Like it was the last of the big four. Yeah. And it has it has and it's the biggest like their whole stick is the biggest part of something. But WrestleMania kind of speaks for itself. It's the granddaddy of them all. It's the Rose Bowl of wrestling. Um, Royal Rumble has the ultimate gim- has the ultimate gimmick gimmick match in and of itself. Uh, Survivor Series, since it's moving to since it's pretty much War Games, uh, like almost every year, almost every year. There it stands on its it stands on its own and it works out. But SummerSlam needs to find its own identity because it literally just is a warmer WrestleMania. Um, and I don't think that's gonna be enough in the grand scheme of things. It ha- something has to be big. I think moving the King of the Ring to pretty much be kind of the bridge, you know, to SummerSlam makes sense. Uh, but SummerSlam has to has to kind of find its identity so that it can, if, when it does get to this major status, I mean, it's already major, but when it does get that status, it really has to stand on its own. My other concern with moving everything to two nights is the Rumble, in particular the Rumble. Um, 
because be it as it may, since its inception, the women's rumble has shit on the men's rumble more often than not. Since its, in- the since past its inception, two yeah. Years, 100% the past two years. The year Asuka won, arguably, that was the first Shinsuke's one. Win. That was the first yeah, one. That yeah, that one felt bigger than Shin's win. It was. Uh, the, the year Bianca won over, um, she won over, was it Drew? No, that was Rhea. Rhea um, beat Bianca. I forgot which one Bianca. No, did Bianca beat Rhea in the uh it was Bianca beat Rhea, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Bianca uh, beat Rhea if, to go it was the it was in the uh it was in the Thunderdome. Correct. Um but you you see my point like since its inception there have been multiple times where the women's rumble has killed it. So I yeah. think maybe moving them to two nights would give each rumble a chance to shine. And I think Bianca it would. And Edge were the same year. So that was 2021. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm concerned about that because you have to make sure because I mean I I think the women put on better stories and at a lot of the time some better matches when they're given time and stuff but I'm concerned if the women highlight a night of a rumble is it going to be I would be interested to see the sales if you're doing like mm-hmm. a women specific main event and that's you know announced the same thing if they did a women's war games. Are they, is that night going to sell as well as something highlighted by men? Because unfortunately, we're still in a very male dominated uh, industry from the fans to backstage. And I would be interested to see the, the numbers if they do move towards that. I think it's possible they can do well because these names, the SummerSlams, your Rumbles, your Manias, your Survivor Series, they're, it's pretty much in, in, in a, like it's a, it's a brand in and of itself, and people will come just for the name. But I, I, I'm interested to see if it's going to be sellouts both nights for, for those stuff, especially if you highlight the women outside of the men. I hope it will be. I think giving them two years, they, it, it should be able to get that way. But there's got to be a lot of investment in, the, in women and women's storylines leading up to this. I've, I've, just, I've spoken on this I've, a lot, and it's, it sucks that we have to say it the way we do, but like – the women don't get the time on TV, so they don't feel as big on a marketing perspective, so they don't draw as well. Yeah. And it all trickles back to the way the company handles that time. I say it a lot that WWE specifically is no longer just a wrestling show. It's a television show, like a dramatic television show about pro wrestlers now. Yeah. OK, and I feel like at the core of it they're they've got the five hours of TV seven. If you include NXT for a 200 person roster, there's just not enough time for them to develop the stories, because for every Becky Lynch, Bianca Belair and Jay Cargill, you've got a Seth Rollins and a Cody Rhodes and a Roman Reigns and a Solo Sokoa. And a, you see my point. Yeah. Like there's five to one male to female ratio. So it's already tough to get the TV time in wrestling. It's even tougher to get TV time for women in wrestling. And then you start adding on all the other, like the, the difficulties, you know what I mean? It's like plus five difficulty because of this. And it's, there's just not enough hours to get it over. And I think that's at fault of the company at this point, because They've got women. They're talking about making Becky Lynch the highest paid women's wrestler of all time. And Ooh. if Ooh. if Mercedes is clearing $10 million a year, and that's including her transportation and all the stuff that goes into it, yeah. Becky's going to have to clear that. What does that mean for Seth or Drew or you know all of these guys when they go to re-sign then? Because I wrote about it for Last Word. When Okada came over talking about making 400 yen and that equated to $12 million a year or whatever it was, I said that that would be like a quarterback in the NFL signing an unprecedented, unheard of deal. And then everybody coming into the free agent market going, I'm about to make so much fucking money. Exactly. Because now they've skewed the market. If Sasha's the biggest star in the world and she's making $10 million a year, I know you love her. I'm not taking away from it, mm-hmm. but that means every other star that feels like they're an equal or bigger draw than Sasha will now expect Sasha money. Yeah, she created the floor. She's the floor. Ex- 
Exactly. So now I feel like the question is going to be how many of these huge, we talked about the seven figure wrestler being the it factor. You get paid a million dollars a year to fucking wrestle. That's huge. Yeah. Now you're looking at people who are getting eight figure contracts in wrestling and you're like, holy shit. Yeah. 20 years ago, there weren't million dollar wrestlers. No. Like, very, you could count on one hand how many million dollar wrestlers there are. Now they have people. We're talking about people making seven and eight figures a year, yeah. not the full length of your contract. It's nuts the market shift for the sport. Yeah, the market. Sorry, shift. that was a little long winded. No, but I makes... just wrote about it, so it was fresh <laughs> on my mind. <laughs> yeah, nah, dude, that that is perfect. No, it's it's the 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 market is, is crazy. They're also rake. I mean, and I'm not going to blame any wrestler for asking for their money because. The numbers speak for themselves. WWE outside of TKO, WWE by itself, nine billion. AEW, two point three three billion. Yeah, I'm gonna ask for some money. <laughs> like you're gonna pay me. <laughs> you know, you, you're. I know what your bottom line is. I know what the reports are. Like you're gonna pay me, <laughs> like as as much as I can get. You know, so I I, I get that. Um, but yeah, no WWE. Moving to two nights, this could be a sign of things to come. I'm all for it. It makes everything big. It makes every. It makes all of my vacation trips that much more special. I've always wanted to go to Minnesota and Minneapolis. This gives me a great excuse to stay for at least an extra day. <laughs> if you go, oh my God, there's a place that's called Fire Lake. It's in Mall of America at the the Mall of America Blue. That is okay? the one thing I need to. Add. That's the one thing I need WWE or NXT to do. We need to do a show in Mall of Americas just for old time's sake. Uh, when I was working for a company called HEI, mm -hmm. uh, no free shout outs. They were a hotel like portfolio. They had like 93 properties. I did task force. So they would pack me up and move me from hotel to hotel. Yeah. And I spent two weeks in Minneapolis at the Mall of America Blue helping open or reopen Fire Lake after their renovation. And we put a big like live fire hearth where they had the big rollers to move the meat up and down. <laughs> nice. Oh, oh my God. It's so fucking cool, dude. Like dry aged meat. And I helped Ooh. start all of this. So if you go to Minneapolis and they're still open, check out Fire Lake, dude. Loved that restaurant. One of my coolest projects. I will definitely check it out. I have some people who are strongly connected to the state of Minnesota. Potentially a former NFL player. But anywho, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> moving on to some AEW news and some interesting AEW news. But AJ Hoover actually dropped to us on the chat. But Salmon Suit Be Damned, Mark Henry will no longer be saying, and now time for the main event on, what is it, Collision? Or is it, or, or is, what's, what's the one on Friday? Uh, Rampage. Rampage. He will no longer say, now it's time for the main event on Rampage. Mark Henry has announced on Busted Open Radio, but he will be leaving AEW. And this just in, according to AJ Hoover, thank you, by the way, Arn Anderson also announced that he is leaving AEW as well. So my question to you, Mr. Wilbur Gray, is this... Is this a sign of them going back to WWE? Or are they taking a break? I think more so, in my opinion. I think Mark's going back to WWE. I don't know about Arn. I think Ar and Jake Hager. Jesus Christ. Oh, Jesus. Jesus Christmas. Um, okay, there's an exodus going on right now. Uh, so Mark Henry, Arn Anderson, Jake Hager all announced they were leaving AEW in the presumable future or not renewing their contracts or what have you. So give me your predictions, Will Gray. Where are they all going? Uh, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to AJ. He's the uh, EVP over at uh, Rivet City Radio. He's a big supporter of the shows. I, if, I'm not sure how much he sticks around here, if he followed me or not. Great dude. Love AJ Hoover. Big shout out there. Yeah. I think that Arn is retiring. As he um, should. I think he's just he's seen the sunset. He's riding off into the distance. Like, let him do his thing. Yeah. He might sign a Legends deal, but who cares? He owns the rights to the Four Horsemen. So anytime somebody uses that, like, they have to pay Arn Anderson now, not yeah. the WWE or WCW or NWA. So let him just go off and retire. One thousand percent. Jake Hager is one of those unfortunate, like, good luck in your future endeavors, my guy. Like... I don't know, like, what to say about that. Like, Jake Hager might go back to WWE, but I'm not real sure. He wasn't a Triple H guy. He was a Vince guy who didn't make the cut. So I'm yeah. not sure where he would land there. 
Um, you can't do his old character because it's scream xenophobia. <laughs> yeah, like there's a there's a lot of things wrong with that. What him and Dutch were doing back in the yeah. day. And like, if go back and Google Dutch Mantel and Jake Hager, and you'll see some shit. Yeah, I was like, oh uh, boy, I looked at like just thinking about that gimmick now in like modern times. Like, oh my god, like this is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> So I think for the most part, so it was Arn, it was Jake, and who was the third one? I'm sorry. Uh, Mark. Oh, yeah, Mark Henry. Yeah. Um, he 100%, I could see him just signing a Legends deal and just going off into the WWE sunset and being used whenever they want to use him. Because like he he wants to have that one last match, and he couldn't get it in AEW, so maybe he goes off and gets booked somewhere and does a you know, the world's strongest man's final match or some shit. Yeah. Like, I don't know, but like I say, essentially him and arm will both end up on legends deals and riding off into the WWE sunset to be used whenever they need that retro nostalgic pop. Yeah. Mark Henry's hall of pain run is one of the greatest championship runs ever. Uh, it is, it is ridiculous what his, what he was able to do with that character when it let's just let him loose. Uh, I can never see Mark Henry coming back. I mean, Mark Henry's the reason we got Bianca Belair. Like he's the one that discovered her because Mark Henry apparently just loves social media. And that's how he found Bianca. He found her on an Instagram video or something. And he was like, Hey, you want to work for WWE? <laughs> that's, that's pretty much that's, what, the, what it was. <laughs> that's one of those like fake ass text messages where you get a call from a Stanford number and they say they're from WWE and you're like, no man, fuck you. Yeah. Like, <laughs> No, you're not. Yeah. Like, which, you know, like you hang up on them and then they immediately call you back because they know they don't, that you don't believe them. Like, I feel like that's probably how that went. Yeah. Bianca was like, the fuck do you mean you're Mark Henry? And do I want to come? <laughs> what? <laughs> like, <laughs> Who are you? Yeah. No, I think the, the story was, um, he was, she, he saw a video of her and uh, she, she was a bodybuilder and she was in like a, uh, she was in like a weightlifting competition. That's when he saw the video and he was like, Oh, Oh, hold on a second. And like DM'd her on Instagram. Um, I think he also might have, an, outside of Cody, I think he also had a Jade Cargill influence as well. I think anybody who looked at Jade in any position and were like, oh shit, she's not made for the ring would be absolutely batshit crazy. Yeah. Like <laughs> even going back to when she very, very first got the AEW and was, I'll say, at her smallest in stature, both weight and muscle mass and ability. Yeah. She still towered above the other women in that women's division. And over the last three years, she's gotten so good so fast. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I would rival it with like borderline a Logan Paul because when she left AEW, people were concerned about how well she would hang in it, WWE. And she went from being like, oh, I wonder if she can hang to going like, I can't wait for the turn to happen because the banger we're going to get when we see her and Bianca mm -hmm. at WrestleMania next year, you know, like that's where we're at in such a short amount of time. It's ridiculous. Yeah, no, WWE did the right thing. Like looking back at it, WWE did the right thing. Of just dangling the carrot of Jade Cargill for months. When's it gonna happen? When's it gonna what happen? When's it gonna happen? It was a where where, where is she going? Where, where when, is she going? Where, when, when, where, where it was a yeah. master class. Absolute Perfect. master class. And then what was she? 27 in the room? They gave her they gave her mythical 27. They gave, <laughs> yeah. They gave her 27 and the place went nuts and she delivered. Absolutely I was delivered. In the building yeah. at the room this year and it was nuts yeah so good she absolutely delivered the the biggest shock is she she lifted naya like she was a child i said oh my goodness what is going on <laughs> yeah no so i i think mark comes back i think specifically to help out with some of the younger talent backstage be that be that veteran presence and things like that and with all these people leaving AEW, a lot of people that we i think we talked about on your show were snagged up maybe because they didn't AEW didn't want them going anywhere else um you know i wouldn't be surprised if show leaves you know if show's still even under contract i would not be surprised if show leaves because you know show turns like show turns more than nascar cars do so i wouldn't be surprised <laughs> he does i wouldn't be surprised if he uh leaves either but let's go on to uh so, so back to wwe as we return king and queen of the ring absolutely uh pretty on par show with everything saudi show um 
It was a predictable show, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't fun. We knew mostly what was going to happen outside of a couple of things. Um, but like I said, it doesn't mean the quality was going to lack at all because it was a good quality show. The biggest surprise I think I had was Liv Morgan winning, winning the title from Becky. And initially I was like, did they summer a punk Liv Morgan's run? Because Liv Morgan Revenge Tour is a t-shirt that should have been show, sold all the way through SummerSlam. I would have bought one. If I was if I was going to SummerSlam, I'd be like, let me get a Liv Morgan Revenge Tour shirt. Like <laughs> I would be that guy because it it fits it fits the motif of, of summer. Um, and so I was like, why are you doing this early? Dom being an idiot and screwing it up, or maybe he didn't, we don't know yet. Um I was like, this seems rushed to me. But then you add the fact that Becky's contract is coming up soon or is, has already expired or will expire by the end of this week. And the fact that she wasn't supposed to be champion. This is an outlier. This was, hey, Becky, we need a favor because Rhea just shattered her collarbone, I think, and can't do anything. <laughs> um, like, we need you to hold the ship. This is clearly a favor. But Becky said, okay, I'll do it, but I'm only doing it up to this point, and the rest are on your own. And Becky Becky did what she was supposed to do. She carried it for as long as she could. She pushed the storyline. She helped to make, she did her best to make live like a million bucks. I believe she has succeeded for the most part. But who knows what happens from there? It's all on Liv. What are your thoughts on that match in particular, Will Gray? The Becky Liv match, and I'm gonna be honest, I'm not, I'm not a big Liv guy. She's not really my cup of tea in ring in character, so I'm not a big, you know, like I'm not jumping out of my seat popping because Liv Morgan is now the women's world champion. That's just <laughs> not the case in any capacity. Yeah. Um, Becky is one of those people though, where I feel like just about no matter what, she's going to put a banger on. Yeah. So going into it, I expected at, at minimum, a good match. And that's kind of what we got. So it's almost disappointing because like Becky could do so well, but I think it was Liv that just kind of like, she had to pull Liv up. Yeah, to match her, but she had to pull her so far up. Becky was only able to do so much, and it's just maybe that's just me being, you know, maybe nihilistic just because I don't care about Liv Morgan, but she just doesn't do it for me. Yeah, she's not convincing. Um, and then when we get to what happened last night, we'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we but are. like, um, it just to me it was good, not great. And when you're doing these huge shows, they have to every match has to be great if there's only five matches. Every match in a pay-per-view has to be great anyways, but especially if there's only five matches on the card. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you only have five matches. You're only, you're which means you're getting a lot of time. You have to create, you have to deliver. That's what made that's what made original NXT so good because it was the pressure of the moment. He said Triple H said, you guys are the match. There's only five of you. You're getting 20 to 30 minutes a match. Maybe 40 if you're the main event. I'm giving you enough time. Don't fuck this up. Is pretty much what it was during the takeover days. <laughs> you know? No, 100%. Yeah. You get enough time to tell a story. So tell the story. <laughs> like, there's no excuse for you not to tell the story with the time I'm giving you. Um so there's that. Obviously, we had the IC title match, which was it happened. It's a thing. What's going on, Hex? Um, it's, it, it was a thing. That's still to be can, that's still to be kind of drawn out. Sami Zayn is back to his great Captain Sabaho character. If you watched Raw last night, he's out there saving some more hoes. Um, <laughs> you know. And then we get the King and Queen of the Ring matches, which Gunther perfect choice. Uh, Naya, I'm I like I knew Gunther was probably gonna win. But Nia Jax almost killing a woman on live TV. And God, I would give anything to be in Lyra's spot, though. <laughs> yeah. Like, just to be honest. Listen, they they trust her a lot. I don't know if that has to do with the Becky influence um, and Becky vouching for her, but they trust Lyra a lot. She just got drafted. She went to the finals of the Queen of the Ring. She she was a very convincing babyface. And Nia sat on her and did 
that there they have to have a photo of her sitting on Lyra with the Yokozuna bonsai drop pose. It was picturesque, perfect for her to for her to do that. Um, it's I like I would get like if I could find that photo and blow it up and meet and I'd be like sign this for me because that's a beautiful shot if they're able to get it. Um, but she, she, I think more than Gunther, because Gunther's kind of a given. Gunther already kind of hails himself as like a king of the ring. Um, but I think Naya, from a character perspective, is going to run roughshod with this gimmick. Whether she's a very serious heel, but I still think she could do a lot more as a comical heel. Because if you follow Naya Jax on the socials, Naya Jax is hysterical. Like, she's just a naturally goofy woman. Um... But her in this, her in this queen thing, her being emotional, her taking a knee to Triple H as the King of Kings gimmick, brilliant there. Um, and then her going straight into character and just telling Kayla to fuck off. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was one of my favorite parts of the show. She was, she was crazy. But it was like Kayla showed up. She was like, get the fuck out of my face. Um, I feel bad for Kayla sometimes. I hope she doesn't take it seriously. But I think, um, I think Nia is going to be amazing. I don't think she'll win at SummerSlam. I wouldn't be surprised if she does. Uh, but I think Nia is going to be amazing of all the of all the people winning. If they don't do any shenanigans and they keep the brand split real, and we do get Nia and Bailey as planned and announced on Friday, or when they do it on Friday or whatever yeah. happens. I 100% will be behind that match. They will slap. They will beat the shit out of each other. And I honestly, I've been on Team Nia since she came back. Absolutely. Like her first run wasn't so, so she made the comeback at the the Rumble a few years ago. And then we really didn't see anything from her. her. But this, yeah, they hit her for a while. Yeah. This most recent run, like she's more convincing now as a champion than when she actually held the SmackDown Women's Championship. Yeah, that's what's wild to me is this version of Nia Jax is the best version of Nia Jax. And if this is the one that doesn't hold the belt, that has to be seen as a fumble by WWE creative because you're absolutely right. Let her be that old school comedic hill like. Let her lean into it and yeah. be the person. Like, think when we Christian and Edge were doing the the benefit for people with flash photography. Five second bullshit. poses, yeah, yeah. You know, like have her lean into that. Maybe not that, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. That kind of like comedic hill. We don't give a shit. I'm going to do whatever I want, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like she would dominate that. And uh, Bridget, you're wild for calling her Big J Lo. <laughs> 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 that is that is that is a very wild statement. But no, Naya Naya's where Naya really impressed, obviously in the ring, but also her promo work. Like so when she came back and she went up against Becky, the thing that sold me, Becky was all fiery wanting to fight her, and she literally said, You need this more than I do, and walked away. I was like, that's brilliant. <laughs> I was like, that's absolutely brilliant. The second thing that she did was uh the presser when they were in Australia which is where I think she should be the comedic heel. She goes, guys, I'm so happy to be in my hometown. I was born in Australia. So glad to be like, my parents got smart and moved me to San Diego, but I'm so happy to be back. (laughs) Like, I was like, this is great. (laughs) This is absolutely great. She's going to get so much heat. Um, So yeah, we got Queen Naya, uh, King Gunther, and then we also have Cody because Cody had adrenaline in his soul and had to be the guy who sponsors Prime. (laughs) Um, and listen, it was a great match. It was they 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 had a little bit of a shorter build because everything's kind of so crunched up now. Like three weeks, we're gonna talk about Clash. Um, so uh so but they did what he did. Cody saying, Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna treat you like a pro wrestler. You know, I like I, you are you're gonna you're gonna be baptized by fire now, uh, which I think was a great line for Cody to pull. Um you know, he's like, he's like, I see you're dedicated to this. We're going to see how dedicated you are to this sport. And the match did what it needed to do. Told a great story. Logan Paul, I hate saying it every time. He just gets it. And it, it upsets me because I don't like him as a, as a person, but I respect him as a performer. He just gets it. And I bet I can almost bet for sure. He ad libbed him and Cole. I think that I think he ad libbed him and Cole, and it was brilliant. It was. It felt like it was, and 
the one thing, and this is, the, I have to nitpick here, and that's almost what makes me angry about Logan Paul in ring, is I have to be nitpicky with him. And <laughs> yeah. the one thing is, I feel like he gets exposed on the mic. When you give him a script and you expect him to be a good actor, that's where he has trouble because he's only good at being Logan Paul. Yeah. You know what I mean? Even if you give him lines that sound like Logan Paul, he doesn't deliver them right. He's one of those, like, I'm not, this is going to be wild and don't think I'm comparing him to this person. I'm just using a reference point to how he talks about doing his promos. And that was John Cena. Mm. Cena was like, I never got scripted. They just gave me my talking points that they were like, you got to make sure you hit these points yeah. in your promo. It's extemporaneous and like, in uh, nature. Exactly. And I think Logan Paul might be that person. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm not saying he's anywhere remotely close to Cena. That's not what I'm saying. But I think he could be better if you just give him his talking points and you just let him riff as Logan Paul. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I when I do my prepared speeches, I never write things. I'm very I'm a I'm a big talking point guy. Like what do I need to hit? I will I'll get myself there when I need to get there. That, that's, that I'm the exact yeah. same way. I used to be a script word for word guy for botch spots. Can't do it. And now it's literally like you've seen my notes. Yeah. Intro pissed off for greatness. And like, all I do is just tell me it's like a roadmap, like a blueprint of what I need to make sure we talk about. And then I just fill in the gaps. Yeah. You just, we will get there. We just, we just let us go. Just let me go. We will get there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. And, and we've gone there and King Queen ring solid, solid show. Again, expected outcomes for the most part um, outside of maybe the Becky and Liv thing. But when you really look into it, Liv had to win and Liv also had to be put over like Rover as best they could in a calamity that was that steel cage match on Raw. But after the show went off air on the USA Network, apparently it still was running on YouTube TV. And I saw this, I think, early, late last night or well, the, the video started making rounds very quickly after the show got caught, like at 11, at 11 a.m. Or not 11, at 11 p.m., that feed caught immediately. The same thing, yeah. Hard stop. Hard stop. Same thing happened last week um, with the Gunther winning and beating Jay. Hard stop. Um, and it blows my mind. So we missed this live, but pretty much what happened um, is... Liv got out of the ring. She won, blah, 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 blah. Dom, obviously, being a... I, I can't fault Dom for this. It was, it was a, such a cartoony finish, but I kind of <laughs> liked it. Dom screwed up again. And then you have Dom's at the middle of the middle of the walkway. Liv is walking by him. And I knew what was going to happen because I saw the eyes. I saw Liv's eyes, and I go, she's going for it. I have seen those eyes Many different occasions, not on TV. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know that look yeah. when it's coming. Yeah, I saw the look. I go, oh, oh, here we go. <laughs> and she just attacked this man on on national TV. And the internet went apeshit. Um, in my mind, I was like, you guys have to see this coming, right? Like, they've been setting this up for weeks. <laughs> um Sportsnet in Canada show to say hey, Canada's doing something right. Thank God for Canada. Um, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, no. um, <laughs> and the internet blew up. It has gotten extremely messy. This is now outside of Cody, whatever's doing on SmackDown. This is the number one storyline in WWE right now. <laughs> yes, there were a lot of people probably on 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 the socials, me included, saying it should have been me. And listen. I know we're supposed to hate Dom, but Dom in the last year, year and a half is in a storyline with Rhea where he's supposedly supposed to be sleeping with her. He got married in real life to somebody who I probably have equal caliber and looks or whatever. Um, I think might've been to his longtime girlfriend and is now, uh Oh, we, Oh, I, I, I see surrender Cobra in on his head. What has happened? Will Gray? We have, we have to stop right now. What did I miss? We have, I think we have breaking news. I have surrender Cobra in his, Oh, I love nice Tennessee tattoo, by the way. What is going on, Will Gray? You speak to me here. The TNA Women's Champion Jordan Grace just walked out in an NXT ring to square off against Roxanne Perez. Oh, my goodness. Holding the belt 
on T on in NXT TV. Whoa. She's standing there with a TNA belt, Whoa. facing off with the NXT Women's Champion. Oh um, my god! I don't mean to derail your show. No, no, I derail. See this coming, derail. I'm, uh, <laughs> I would I would politely say I'm a foot in with <laughs> TNA. I knew about her being at the Rumble. Okay, okay? That, that's a big deal then. Yes, I didn't know about, about this. I've, this wasn't even on my radar. And she's cutting a promo in NXT right now. Oh. And she just said, let me introduce myself. I'm the TNA Knockouts Women's Champion on Holy WWE. Holy shit. Wow. Somebody's playing chess back there in corporate. And they're doing it real well. Wow. Because the last time I TNA did a major collab, a major, major really announced collab was a couple years ago with AEW. And I was, I myself was highly critical of this partnership because when it played out, it was aggressively one-sided and it did nothing for impact at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I was like, this was a waste. It appears very clearly from the rumble to apparently several minutes ago that TNA got out of that deal. <laughs> and this is and WWE is came big. swooping in and said, we will take care of you. Let me speak out of turn go right, right now. Go right ahead, sir. TNA has a fantastic working relationship with AAA. So this means Aren't, that is that on WWE, paper? Is that on paper? Like they, they made that public agreement, right? They have an exclusive working relationship with one another. Yeah. So that means WWE now being in bed with TNA automatically makes it a menage. What the fuck? Yes, it because does. that means WWE, AAA and TNA are out all three interlaced with one another by this working deal. Yeah. Holy shit. That's amazing. I love wrestling I, in 2020. This, this is this is better than the multiverse saga in, in Marvel, right? <laughs> <laughs> I did not see Jordan Grace showing up in WWE TV and challenging the women's world champion. This is a champion like, versus cha this is an interpromotional champion versus champion. Yeah, that's amazing. Like, I legitimately, as soon as her music hit and I looked at the screen, I was like, oh, shit, guys. Like, yeah, I last, I, you pulled the surrender cobra. I was like, what is going on? I just, I've, I've, I've had it on, but I, volume's off. I'm not really listening. It's just there. Yeah, I get and it. Like, so all of a sudden, I, when I saw it, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> That's that's big, man. That's like huge. Because listen, you add yeah. you add WWE's NXT's women's division. I say the NXT women's division in particular because there is a boatload of untapped talent there. And they have the largest female roster between Raw SmackDown and NXT by leaps and bounds. Um, and they're used a lot more uh on TV. You add that with arguably year in and year out for over a decade, the best women's division in all of pro wrestling, the TNA knockouts division. You hundred percent. Yeah, you put them together. Jesus Christ! Only the knockouts yeah. division and NXT have collectively the two best booked women's divisions in pro wrestling, mm. in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, and now they're together. Like this is I, that's, wild. I love everything about that. Like yeah. I'm happy for NXT and Shawn Michaels. Like the opportunity to work with TNA. Like that's gonna be amazing. Come on, Oba Femi versus Moose. <laughs> Moose should have been an Moose should have been an NXT years ago, but Moose Moose screwed Moose. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Moose screwed Moose is amazing when you say it that way <laughs> because like you think about it. And you're like, yeah, he kind of did. It's like the Rascals, too. Like, all four Rascals had a shot to be there, and only two of them pulled it off. Yeah, yeah. Like, and one got, unfortunately, screwed out of it. But, hey, it happens, um, unfortunately. But, yeah. A thousand percent agree with that statement. <laughs> yeah. And we know what he was accused of. And I've, I'm like, when I hear the people st standing up for that kid, I'm like, holy shit, maybe he did just get dicked over over nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like a, a vengeful, spiteful woman cost this man millions of dollars. Absolutely. And put Wesley on as like by himself. And Wesley's done good so far. Um, but holy crap. Wow. That totally took a turn on this show. That's probably the best breaking news we've ever had on this show, to be completely honest. That is a clear world's colliding. So 
This has become a Cold War arms race between AEW and WWE. This is the total Cold War arms race right now. They are they are gathering. So you have AEW took New Japan. Um, Correct. You know, and all that New Japan can offer. WWE not only now potentially pretty much has TNA by default. Triple it's AAA, right? Triple A because Triple. New Japan and CMLL are with AEW, and that's what AEW got. Yeah. WWE gets TNA and Triple A. Oh my god! And what? And don't forget, WWE also has. Uh, they had. Um, who did the? Who did they? They sent over William Regal's son to do the Triple Crown tournament. Uh, all Japan Pro Wrestling. They have All Japan. That was their counter. Which is also Noah. Pro wrestling Those Noah, two yeah. Go together. So, like, because they've already done pro wrestling Noah as well with Shin going over to do uh, Great Muda's uh, last match. That's true. So, we, we're seeing some shit, Ricky. Yeah, we're, we're, like, we're seeing wow. some shit. <laughs> and then don't forget, WWE already has been in bed for years with progress over in the yeah. UK. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and um, there's a progress and there's the one in Germany, I think, WXW as well. WXW, yes, sir. Fantastic promotion, too. If you don't watch, if you're not into indie wrestling, those are two fantastic indie promotions. They do have a lot of stuff on Peacock, I believe, as well, if you wanted to watch. But holy shit, this beats live and dom shit. Like, that is mind blowing. I didn't mean to. Like I said, I (laughs) apologize. No, do not. Do not, sir. Holy shit, that was big. She walked out, and I was like, holy crap. (laughs) That is worlds colliding in the best way possible, which makes me believe that NXT is going to do worlds collide. They just haven't said anything yet. I I could 100%. (laughs) I mean, I could see. I said it on our show a couple weeks back that it won't surprise. I will see. We will see Natalia Neidhart in a TNA ring before the end of the year is what I said. And mm, uh, yeah. And now her showing up here makes that almost set in stone. Yeah. Like, Videos in our just, discord. Thank you, Frats. Yeah. There is. We have the video in the discord. I will look at that a little bit later. Wild, wild time. So, yeah, Dom and Liv happen. But who cares at this point? Um, <laughs> 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 so moving on in three weeks time from uh from from all of this we have clash at the castle uh is is occurring um in scotland home of drew mcintyre and where he's he got cleared he's going up against the bisexual undertaker known as damian priest looking very bisexual undertaker in the shot for clash at the castle uh this is a, probably going to be the the main event because it's drew it's scotland um this is the first thing that's announced there's gonna be more announced this is a this is a sprint we only had three weeks to set this up. This is a sprint. And then we got SummerSlam. Well, we have money in the bank, excuse me, and then SummerSlam. Um, Correct. You know. It's going to be a summer. Yeah, like. it's, it's it's a fast summer. Um, you have money in the bank, SummerSlam. We can't rule out um, NXT's um, Battleground. No, it's battle, or well, Battleground. Battleground's, Battleground. Battleground is next week. And you ha- they already announced NXT Underground with uh, Shayna and, um, and uh, crap, what's your name? Oh, I totally forgot. Uh, it's Shayna and whoever Shayna was helping to beat uh, Natty and them. Lola? Yeah, Lola. It's Shayna and Lola Vice and NXT Underground at at in in the UFC Apex. Okay. So you have that. There is a pot and Roxanne doesn't have a doesn't have somebody to fight. We might be seeing Jordan Grace versus Roxanne in an NXT of branded event in a week from now. That's absurd. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's absurd. Be what it is me. We now have Clash That's of the Castle. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. We have Clash of the Castle. Uh, Drew Priest going on. Uh, my brain is fried. I love this. <laughs> um, here's the thing. This is a quick early prediction. I don't think Drew's winning. I think we I think Punk screws this for him. I think Drew wins only because as punk drew at SummerSlam. Fair. Like if I were a betting man, because I would say they want that world title tied into punk whenever he comes back. Yeah. Because he w- he wanted the world title before he got hurt. So I would say Drew will probably win at Clash. Okay. And that's a fine run. That's a fine run for Damian. I mean, it's only two months in the grand scheme of things. So what are you gonna do? Because there's also the thing of like 
you have to have Judgment Day be in complete shambles, either via Liv Morgan or Dom Mysterio by the time Rhea comes back. And I think, I think, my initial thought when they put the title on Liv, I think Rhea's going to be back sooner than expected. Because I wouldn't be surprised if they set up Rhea Liv for SummerSlam. I would not be surprised at that at all. I think it's a high possibility that that, may ha- that might happen. I would be perfectly fine with that to be the case. Yeah. I Like, 100%. And I think that's kind of the perfect way to get Liv or to get Rhea out and away from Judgment Day is to kind of let it, him losing the belt, and then it builds the money in the bank, then something else happens. Rhea comes back. They start building to SummerSlam. Yeah. Rhea will get the belt back, but the rest of Judgment Day will be gone or in her rearview mirror, and she'll be dealing with just this Dom, you know, yeah. like the the Dominic Mysterio custody battle rewritten in history. This time it's Rhea and Liv. Dominic on a pole, you know? Dominic in a, in a shark tank, it's suspended above yeah. the ring. <laughs> Yeah, Dominic in a Dominic on a pole match. There you go. That's exactly yeah. what we need in 2024. <laughs> Dominic on a pole. Listen, we had Darby Allen suspended in the air, so there's that. Uh so I mean this could be a perfect setup for Rhea to come back. Listen, this storyline needs a lot of care, not Priest and and Drew. Because Priest already set the bar last night with calling out calling out Drew's wife in at the end of a promo. <laughs> I was like, Jesus Christ. I saw it in his face. So he, he got to New York. He's like, oh, okay. So you're, you're going to, is that what you're trying to do? You're trying to break me? Okay. I just want to see something real quick. I'm like, I know that. I know how he put together those words. I was like, oh, that's a New Yorker coming out. Just about to talk shit mm-hmm. <laughs> real quick. He laid it down yeah. too. I'm, even if Damien only holds the belt for 65 days or whatever it is. I would still call that a win for your first title. Yeah, absolutely. He's had a couple house show defenses. He defended it at France. If he loses it at a second pay-per-view, you know, a handful of defenses over two months on your first title reign is a win. Dusty's first title reign was like six days. Yeah. You know what I mean? Flair's first title reign was only two weeks or something crazy. Jericho's like first that. title like, was two hours, I think. <laughs> something like that no you're right yeah. yeah and then he then he came back and won the undisputed title and beat rock and austin both in one night exactly, so yeah all of that goes to show you like your first title reign means nothing it's a test run you know exactly just to make sure you can be the guy look at orton orton was the youngest champion on the planet and they dropped it from him in like three weeks for the same reason like he just wasn't ready yet yeah and so I think a good two month run is perfect for your first title reign. You you made it for two pay per view cycles. That's good. Yeah, no, that that's very good. You were able to hold the showdown for that. Yeah. So we're gonna have more on that a little bit later. But let's move on to double or nothing after the calamity that has been this show and the breaking news of all breaking news. I thought Arn and Jake Hager was going to be the biggest thing we had on the show, but apparently not um, <laughs> because we still have to talk about people being set up on fire on double or nothing. Uh, in all honesty. And I watched most of Double or Nothing. Uh, outside of a little shenanigans aside, very good show. Very, very good show. Some people are saying it's better than Mania Night 2. I disagree, um, you know, wholeheartedly. Uh, but that's more so from an entertainment perspective. Wrestling's perspective-wise, very good show. Uh, a little bit a little bit long in the tooth time-wise. Not every match deserves 30, 20, 30 minutes and 60-minute time limits. Like, get rid of that, for God's sakes. We all know it's not going that long. Like, we all know Will Ospreay and Roddy Strong aren't going for 60 minutes. Stop it. It's match one. Um, like, it's like, it's like, shut up. Like, it doesn't actually happen that way. Uh, but overall, it was... Really great Mercedes one, just what I tuned in for. Uh, there was a lot of calamity, a lot of cycle, the like craziness uh, going on. We had a return, we had a debut, uh, we had Edge breaking his leg, <laughs> um, as well because that got announced. Uh, and we we had we had vehicular attempted vehicular manslaughter with somebody being tied to a rope and suspended in midair. We had that same person return and try to set so- and successfully set somebody on fire. And that's the baby face, <laughs> folks. We broke a lot of rules in Double or Nothing. We broke a ton of rules in Double or Nothing. But overall, it was a pretty, pretty wild show in and of itself. What was your highlights, uh, Will Gray? 
I would say my big highlights and my biggest takeaways from the whole night. Um, match of the night, 100% for me personally, uh, Roddy and Will Ospreay. I think they stole the show. I said my sleeper match, though, was the Orange Cassidy Trent Beretta match. Um, I think those two tore the house down. They did great for the story they were telling yeah. and everything that's happened since Best Friends broke up. I still want to see Trent Beretta go back to Rocky Romero and reform a heel Rapungi Vice. I think that would be dope. <laughs> nice. Um, so, so give me that, maybe. Um, I would say my lows. The the Jericho match. I just I don't care. Do you, you know, do you know like, they're giving him a talk show segment on Dynamite this week? He doesn't need it. <laughs> He's getting it. Why? Why would we do that? What's the <laughs> point of giving? You're worried about ratings, and you're dealing with your TV, and you're getting ready to renew your TV deals. So you give Chris Jericho a talk show spot, huh? Yep. He's the learning tree. Why? He's the learning Why? tree. Why? I don't know. That No. <laughs> no, thank you. He's it's got to be the low and I talk about it all the time. Like you can only do so much before the amount of bullshit you did in your career starts to get outweighed by the bullshit you're doing now. Like the bad will eventually outweigh the good with what he's done in his career. Even if he has 25 years of being one of the best, like you can do a lot of damage to that in five or six or 10 years, just doing fucking learning trees and all of that nonsense. It's pretty simple. And it's said best. It's a line that's been quoted since it came out in dark Knight. You have a diver hero, a live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Jericho is way past being wrestling's hero. He is seated pretty comfortably as the villain, and he needs to know it's time to go. You do. He's okay with being the villain, though. That's, that's the problem. That's it. the problem. He does. He doesn't care. <laughs> and like it's and you know for a while Jericho was a man of the business. He almost got into a shoot fight with Brock Lesnar after he thought he bloodied up Randy Orton. Like he's for the boys, <laughs> you know. Hundred. He's for the boys. He gets the business, but I think it's it's that it's that fame monster, as Lady Gaga once said. Um, you know, it's an addiction, and Jericho doesn't understand. He might have a problem now, and it might be getting in the way of progress for the company that he helped to build. He's not helping. What is the? What are the people call it online? The the Jericho vortex. <laughs> that sounds about right. Where like you work with Chris Jericho and you just get in and you just fucking sink and get buried because Jericho doesn't actually know how to put anybody over. He's doing the whole I'm gonna put the young talent over and work with them. But think about it. Who has Jericho worked with that has came out and been like, dude, he is so much better because of that Jericho feud other mm. than MJF, but doesn't count because MJF is a self-made man. Like I'm also biased as fuck, but like <laughs> nobody has happened with MJF that or not MJF with Jericho where you're like, holy shit, like he's better off because of that Jericho feud. And I just don't get it. Yeah. Like, I just don't get it. I'm over Chris Jericho. He used to be one of my favorites, and now he's just like, uh, like why? Why are you on my team? Yeah, he. I mean, at this point, for his mind only, he's probably better as a backstage agent. True, and that's not true, Taekwon. I don't like Goldberg. I'm not really a big <laughs> Cabana guy. Like, <laughs> That's not necessarily true. Yeah. <laughs> Outside of Jericho and the FTW Double or Nothing, which clearly could have been on Dynamite or an episode of Collision, what else do we have going on in this? We had uh, Sasha winning, of course, obviously, because she had to win. You're giving her $10 million. You're not going to have her win her first match. Title or not, she's winning that match. You have too much 100%. money invested in that. You had the triple main events that all happened one after another after another, which, in my opinion, as good as the show was, giant misstep. And then hopefully it'll be rectified the next time I do a major show like All In. Um, Swerve kind of got overshadowed by Anarchy in the Arena, which I I kind of dislike because Swerve's doing a phenomenal job as a pure wrestling champion. You know, heel or babyface, non-understanding. He 
looks great as a champion. And I noticed he had the championship mentality and look when he came out at all in in Wembley last year, I go, that's your new guy. Like that's the guy. Um, and they, it, they got, they finally got around to it. And I, it's one of those things where he might be overshadowed because now you have MJF back and you have this whole elite versus AEW, uh, hodgepodge of a story that's going on right now. I wouldn't be surprised if Tony Khan turns out to be Eric Bischoff and be the, you know, the culprit of us all. Like I can see it going that way very, very quickly. Um, and I think Swerve's in just a, a shit position in a, in a turn and, in, in, in a time where he should be highlighted. Cause if you look at it from a grand scheme of things, AEW, the most successful thing AEW did in five years was make Swerve a champion because they did what took WWE over 50 fucking years to do. They said, we, abs- we see you color non-withstanding. You're our guy. They put an ad, they made an African-American world champion in five years of a company it took WWE about 55 minimum to put it on Kofi. <laughs> and it took the NWA well over 50 because it was 1943 to 1990. What was it? Two? Yeah. 1990. No, it was. Uh, no, it was later than that. Sorry. It's 2002 when our truth won the NWA title. Yes, it was. Yeah, um, he was the first one, right? So, it, yes, he was. So it was 60 years for the NWA then. Yeah. And Ron um, Simmons won WCWs in 1986. Yeah. You know, so they they like. It's a shame because I, I was as I've watched some of AWT, It's a shame they don't highlight that. It is a I think it's a massive misstep. That should have been the thing that should have been in Swerve's promos going into when he won at Dynasty. That should have been the highlighted thing to, uh, that the commentators un- talk about. That should be a talking point at, at all of Tony Khan's pressers. You know, although he says a bunch of wild shit, he all he had to do was say that that's going to turn heads. That's how you create a bigger audience. You made legitimate progressive wrestling history and you don't talk about it. I think that like marketing, that's a misstep, I think. hundred percent. And I also think that in the bigger scheme of things, Swerve is kind of suffering from the same thing that happened with Adam Page. Mm where everything around him is being made to look bigger than the world title. Yeah. Cause you think when hangman had the belt, it was the MJF thing. He had just came back and it was who, when is he going to win the belt or when is he going to go after the belt and all of that? And then the build for blood and guts are ironically around this same time. And all of that, that was happening during hangman's reign. It made hangman Adams page world title feel secondary. Yeah. And it's fucking sucks that they're doing this to swerve because like you said, he's the first one. He should feel like the most important part of the show. And they booked him to kick a match off at 7:58 PM at the turn of the hour. And I was like, you still have over an hour of TV left. Your world champion is going to come out, win a match and leave. And then nobody's going to think about him for now a full week yeah. and an hour. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, it just seemed weird to me for the world champion, the most important person on your roster to not be the last face we see. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's it's that it's that one wild storyline that got bigger. And, you know, I mean, at least the Young Bucks are still playing into their gimmick, whether they like it or not, you know, overshadowing all their talent. Uh, and, and that's and that's apparently what they do best. And they totally went off the rails in this anarchy in the arena match. And if you love a demolition derby you got it in anarchy in the yeah. arena and like i just i was getting i didn't watch it live but i was getting updates from my friend who was watching it live and they were like this is absurd <laughs> they're like i don't know what's going on they're like it's almost midnight somebody got set on fire someone drove a drove a truck into the arena they're blasting music they got they were forced to turn the music off i was like what is going on i know you watched it live will grant i know you have a lot of thoughts you love this match i thought it was entertaining 
Like you don't watch a match like this for the wrestling. You, you watch the match like this for the entertainment side of it. For them taking turns on the mic, you know, stop playing that, play my music now, you know? <laughs> and then Daniel Bryan's like, now play the greatest insurance theme in wrestling history. And they play the final countdown and it plays for like five minutes. And Nick Jackson's like, turn that shit off. Every time you play it, it costs me $200,000. <laughs> We've got a budget here, people. And they go back and forth for the 25 or 30 minutes, whatever it was to end the pay-per-view. And, and to me, again, you're not watching it because you want to see headlocks and takeovers and, you know, hip tosses and stuff like you watch this because you want to be entertained. You want to watch Jack Perry get dunked in an ice bath and then he run down, you know, Darby Allen with a bust. You want to watch FTR get busted open with unprotected head <laughs> chair shot. Twisted people. Like, it's just a good old-fashioned train wreck, and they did it perfectly. Yeah, people are going to go, it was unnecessary, you didn't have to do this, blah, blah, blah. The baby face lit the hill on fire. Like, who cares? In 2024, especially in AEW, there's hardly a real baby face. There's hardly a real hill. Anybody can turn on a dime because it's cool to be the bad boy. You know what yep. I mean? Like, Link. I thought it was cool. Was it perfect? Not by a long shot. But on paper, if you look at the ratings I gave WrestleMania Night 2 and you look at the ratings that I gave Double or Nothing, just purely based on match ratings, it was like 3.8 to 4.2. Yeah. That they were within half a like they were half a point apart as far as like overall match performance. And granted, my shit doesn't matter. I'm, you know, uh, this big in the wrestling world, but they match quality work just based on the wrestling. They were that close. Yeah. And still, I'm a I loved night two of WrestleMania. Thought it was brilliant. Yeah. But double nothing was a banger. Yeah, it is their best. It is it is it is their best show of the year, uh, by and large, uh, at all. And I was at WrestleMania night two, and I've never felt. I'll tell you this right now. I think I don't think I actually mentioned this to you. I've never been so physically exhausted from a show than after the main event of night two. I like I was I was like I have been sports entertained. I'm I am tired. <laughs> like I need to go home and sleep. I am exhausted. Um, it was the gong. The gong did me in. The most unexpected thing I've ever been a part of. And I was there when the Hardys came back and I didn't see that coming. Um, that one totally took me for a loop. Uh, but that gong was just beautiful, beautiful, magnifique storytelling. Speaking of magnifique storytelling, hey, folks, MJF is back. <laughs> MJF is back doing clearly in this photo that I have of him 50 shades lighter than what he showed up in um, had double or nothing. He went pretty crazy with the spray tan. I will tell you, he looks fantastic. He dropped a lot of weight. He was very puffy in like his original one, but he, he cut. He's very lean. He looks like he's better able to perform for the long haul than what he first was. What's hey, good for you. You know, you know, stay in wrestling as long as you can keep our longevity going. And this is where all the craziness in my head, like I noticed a spray tan. I noticed O2 triple H just walking to the ring, just not as buff. Um, um, it was almost like a, it's almost like a clothing shot for clothing shot. O2 triple H, uh, which, but he had the Burberry on the back, which I thought was really freaking funny. Uh, he mm -hmm. mentions that he's back and he's not going anywhere. He has, in my opinion, the cringeworthy tattoo. Um, it's like you know, it's like it's like you put the trophy on your t you put the trophy on the arm of your team that's gonna win like a Super Bowl at the beginning of a year, just hoping and praying mm -hmm. this isn't a bad decision, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, it was for me. It was here's here's my thing on it. Like MJF, I love him. He's a Long Island person. I got to support the Long Island person at some point. But I also know he's a Long Island deuce and that's not a character he's playing. That's him. Like that is him. I know where he's from. I know, like I know the town he grew up in. <laughs> that's him. <laughs> um, that's him. Uh, hundred like hundred percent. But if you're selling yourself, you are a self-made man and you don't need anybody to do that. Why bring up the other company? Why do a blatant cosplay of a, of a executive from another company from 20 years ago? Like that is one of my big gripes with 
AEW as a particular, like you are running your own race. And surprisingly enough, you're doing a pretty good job. All things considered, there is no need for you from your from your owner at a, at a at a media at a media interview for the NFL draft to you when you return after being gone for five months to bring up anybody in any reference to the other company in your comeback promo. Like we get it, you're on TV, you didn't sign. Why are you bringing this up? Why are they still living rent free in your head? Like you are your own person. Stand on that. WWE is not talking about you. They did that once with Sami Zayn in that really random promo segment on Raw, and they were like, "Up, oh, nope, never again." Um, you know, and you know, at this point, you the fact that you guys are still bringing it up shows that it still has an effect on you. And I think that kind of brings down your product because every time you mention it, it's going to have a WCW effect. They're going to be like, oh, why are they so mad at WWE? What's going on there? And that's how you lose people. They have to stop doing this. And MGF has to stop doing that as well. Like the Triple H cosplay alone, I can forgive. Because, hey, who didn't love that moment? <laughs> like, who didn't love that moment? But to bring up to bring up Vince? Why? He's not a factor in WWE for almost as long as he's been out of the, as long as MGF has been away, <laughs> you know, I just, I just like, as for all the, for all the good that's going to be for AEW, the, with MGF returning, there's no need to bring up WWE anymore. You've solidified yourself as another alternative. No need to continue to compare yourself. Okay. I'll give you that. That is the one critique I can get from the man's return. He didn't need the, I didn't need no new Japan or Vince McMahon, you know, yeah. like thousand percent unnecessarily unnecessary line. But other than that, the man knocked it out of the park. Oh, he always does. Like great the vignette origin. coming. Th- oh yeah. The vignette walking through the mansion, walking into the room, seeing all the little pieces of MJF. But the only thing he takes is the dynamite diamond ring. Yeah. And then you see him come out. Out and they almost gave you that little bit like okay maybe he's not back it's just the teaser that he will yeah. be, but then when he walked out I was like holy shit dude <laughs> like this is it yeah no it was it was it was a great moment I from a storyline <laughs> perspective like MJF coming back and Adam Cole coming back like I because Adam Cole was injured for a lot of this run that he was supposed to do it, uh-huh. it I was just like this doesn't really mean anything to me you know because like the story's dead the story is oh yeah no 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 it was it died Yeah, the story is dead so i was like ah this is kind of unnecessary but like if you weren't like i if team aew was going to win which clearly they didn't i would have had mjf return instead of darby have mjf be the surprise fourth man of team AEW. And I think that would have done wonders for me. I see why they didn't because the elite won it. Um, so this is like the best they can do, but I'm interested to see what MGF does with this return. Like, does he finish off Adam Cole? Did you really need to? I don't think so. I think the kick in the nuts is the best way to end that, to end the story at this point, Just kick him in the nuts and move on <laughs> at this point. It's, it's dead. It's a dead have MGF do something with somebody, have him go after Osprey. Screw it. Have him go after Osprey or give him the vacant TNT title because that's going to be vacant because Edge broke his leg and Edge is 50. He's not coming back for a while. You know, you got to give MJF something, but he can't go after Swerve just yet. I would love MJF Swerve as the main event of All In. That would make sense. Yeah, but yeah, and you got to give MJF something to work towards that. And if there's anything we've seen with AEW is that they make their wrestlers work towards getting that big title shot. And it's going to be interesting to see what they do with MGF, who's arguably their biggest star in the company ever, regardless of what Bleacher Report ranked him, which I thought was bullshit (laughs) Um, in in that ranking system. He was, I think he was number three. They gave Mox number one. I was like, wow, huge misstep. And I love Mox, um, but he didn't deserve number one. But that's the MGF thing. The other thing I have with the MGF is not with MGF at all. It's the final thing we're going to talk about. It's this goddamn t-shirt. The spray tan aside, which looks ridiculous, um, MJF's been gone since December. Okay, he, he, they had their they had their big show on Long Island. That was his little farewell. Um, well, he was gone. He had the Players Tribune article. That was great. 
I know there are better artists than pro wrestling tees and AEWs that they have on payroll that could have done a better job than this Comic Sans Times New Roman BS that I'm looking at on my screen. Outside of the fact that he stole the Wolf of Wrestling stick from Stephen Wolf, which he said, this has happened to me three times before, and I'm glad he's a good sport about this. <laughs> um, but you have a plain black shirt with generic white font on both sides of the shirt, and you're selling this on shopaew.com. It's not really a promo here. This is just a fact. There was no. It's a yeah, terrible shirt. Design. This. Do you remember? Do you remember when WWE with that whole stint of doing like just random printing fonts and stuff like that? I was like, this is kind of shitty. This is worse. <laughs> this looks like I told you last night. It looks like it was made in Microsoft Paint. Like they just used the text tool to type the words out. The Wolf of Wrestling saved it as a PNG and put it into their cricket. Yeah. Like that's what it looks like. This is like, this is your number one guy. This is like your only pillar you have left standing. No one has seen Britt Baker forever. Um, you know, uh, Darby's too busy almost getting hit by buses in real life. So like, this is your, la- and Jack Perry literally got, <laughs> Jack Perry, yeah, this, this like, is your last guy standing. You've got to do better. Hell, when edge came back, even though edge is an artist on the low, like edge likes to draw. When Edge came back, he had a shirt primed and ready. He there's a video package. I think it's uh, his 24. Um, he was at he was in Connecticut, sitting with the creative and the merchandise team, being like, "Here are my ideas. Can we get this done mm-hmm. for the Rumble?" When Cody came back, Cody had three shirts. By the time Cody got up, appeared in the Cody Vader at 38, that shirt was on sale in every kiosk in Dallas. As soon as he really, just, <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. WWE is notorious for that. Like there, there is clearly no plan here, and this is upsetting. Like these are the little things that you just you look at AEW and be like, really? Like we've got you. You got to do better at the small things sometimes. Even if they were rushed, they could have gotten a better design out than just a type on shirt. Like just a text based shirt. There was no design to it. There's no logo. There's no Burberry or Not anything. Not one Burberry it's at all. Text. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was a terrible design and it might be up there with some of the worst wrestling shirts I've I'd ever seen. I'd rather buy a Y2AJ shirt. And that's just clearly on nostalgia. <laughs> yeah. No, 100%. Like, ah, uh, it's just, it's, it's disappointing. And if I were MJF, I would throw a fucking fit. I'm like, I would be big mad yeah. about it. I'd be like, seriously, this is the best we can do. <laughs> like you're the top guy, like a picture of his face screaming or something like you've got to do more than this. <laughs> anything, <laughs> anything, anything for the love of God. Uh, oh, Fred, you almost bought a Y2 AJ shirt at Comic-Con? You buffoon. That's that's like the legendary shirt that only got sold for a week. <laughs> <laughs> you could sell that for at least 50 bucks um, somewhere. <laughs> at least. At least. There's going to be some crazy collectors like, yeah, the Y2 AJ shirt, you got it? Yeah. Yeah, you got to get that Y2 AJ shirt. But yeah, don't get this shirt. I wouldn't. I can, I can make this shirt. I can make this shirt and sell it on my merchandise website. Hundred <laughs> percent. I could make. I could have made a better shirt, and I barely have a working like knowledge of InDesign and Photoshop. Yeah. Like I have barely a working knowledge of them, and I could out design a shirt than the Wolf of Wrestling. <laughs> I'm never effing leaving. Like do like, a wolf with a Burberry scarf. It's. That's a great design right there. Hundred percent anything. Uh, a dire wolf from Game of Thrones. Make it look mid like old school medieval style and put the Burberry on the crest of it or something yeah. with it. Like anything. And saying the words, I'm never fucking leaving, even with your biggest guy. This is one of those things where acknowledging that it didn't happen acknowledges that it could have yeah you know what i mean that's a good like, point that's, that's a good point that. yes you know what i mean like the fact that he's a na- acknowledging i'm not going anywhere means to me there was he a possibility that he was idea. gonna he entertained exactly. the idea 
He could. And to me, if you entertained it, that means it's never done. Nope. You know what I mean? Nope. Like, nope. Nope. And I think I think it all came down to timing. I think that's what it was. I think I honestly think it came down to timing. I think when he was being courted, because he was gone for a while, he was gone for a very very long. Uh, December through now, so f- over, over five, five months. months. Yeah. He was gone for a very, very long time, and I think it became came down to timing and his health. Because I was almost certain we were we were getting the Burberry and that theme song on Raw after Mania when Cody showed up, when Cody came back with the belt. Because I was like, what a perfect way! Cody's has a big celebration. His his you know AEW nemesis uh, MGF shows up. It would have been perfect timing. He lives on Long Island. He can travel to Philly within two to three hours, and no one would know that he showed up. Um, he can go under the cover of night or what have you. Obviously didn't happen. I think he had a lot of health stuff going on and it's probably was the easier option for him right now, but I'm, he's still very, very young. He's going to leave at some point there. There's something holding him from being there. And I think it's because he probably feels like he has more stories to tell. A lot of wrestlers leave in promotions because they don't have anything left to tell edge left WWE because he had nothing else to do. There's no other story he could tell. Yeah. Can I tell you something that I noticed as somebody who's I've been in more than one locker room. I've watched more than a couple guys lace their boots, guys and gals collectively. Yeah. His tattoo is perfectly positioned that for the rest of his career, you will never have to see it if he so chooses because he wears tall boots. That's true. Even if he does go to WWE and he could go out there in black tights and black boots, and you still would never see that AEW tattoo because it'll be covered up by his tall boots. So even if he bet on himself for this contract in five years, he could still go to WWE and not give a shit. Yeah. It's true. Like I'm not, I'm not a dummy. I was, I wasn't born <laughs> yesterday. It wasn't too long ago. Though, but like, like that's the thing. Like he put it in a position where it's easily covered for a long time. You couldn't tell I had tattoos unless I chose for you to be able to tell I had tattoos, Correct. you know? And then I reached a point where I stopped giving a shit, but now like he did that. He made it a point. You're not going to be able to tell he has that too, too, unless he wants you to yeah, see it. No, that's, that's a good point. So the door will always be open for MJF because if he has a fantastic run, which it seems like he is, he is hell bent on having a fantastic run, which means his stock at the time that he does, let's say he signs a five year, you know, so by the time, what is it, 2029, 2020, 2030 rolls around, he'll be WWE ready. Very much so. I think his next contract, he'll be in WWE by the 2030s. He'll end his career in WWE with a title yeah, there. I would agree. I, I, I wholeheartedly would agree with that. And hopefully he gets a better t-shirt treatment than what he got right now, because that is atrocious. But ladies and gentlemen, that pretty much concludes our show this week with uh, Mr. Will Gray from Bots, Bots and Share Shots podcast. Will, the floor is yours. What would you like to promote right about now? First and foremost, King Ricky, I want to say thank you for allowing me to be in place of uh, the other will, yes, the other will, a very fine substitute for this will. <laughs> yes, um, I uh, I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. If you're interested in my shenanigans elsewhere, and you're listening to this, you can check my link tree anywhere you do anything on the internet at the Will Gray. And when you find that link tree, it'll take you everywhere I do everything for botch bots and share shots, Rivet City Radio, Off the Top Media, and my writing profile for Last Word on Sports. There you go. Pretty pretty short, simple. And to the point. So with that being said, well, you're going to stick around for the post show for a little bit. Yeah, I'll hang yeah out we're going to we're going to talk some college football on the post show. Actually, there's some fun stuff going on uh, in college football these days. So we're going to stick around for the he's going to stick around for the post show. But until then, folks, ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to Kings of the Rings podcast episode number three hundred and seventy seven, a court of anarchy. Yes, just like the book. I'm kind of a bibliophile these days. I'm your host, King Ricky Rose. You can find me at Ambassador Biggs across all social media outlets, B-I-G-Z, Ambassador Biggs across uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, some people's DMs, less people's text messages, B-I-G-Z, Ambassador Biggs. Find Kings of the Rings podcast at K-O-T-R underscore podcast across all social media outlets. 
outlets. Like, share, subscribe, leave us five star reviews, buy some of our fantastic merch. I got to update some of that. The link is in the description below. By the way, that merch is probably going to be the Wolf of Wrestling. Um, find, <laughs> <laughs> find Wrestle Addict Radio socials at Addict underscore Wrestle on Twitter and at Wrestle Addict Radio everywhere else. Again, the links to all of that are in the description below. When I come back next week, hopefully I'll have one of my hosts back uh, and we'll talk about whatever's going on with Liv and Dom. We're going to preview NXT Battleground. There might be more TNA integration like we saw tonight. The sky is the limit in the world of wrestling. The Cold War of wrestling has begun. Doors are being broken. No doors are forbidden anymore except for door for Slack to be on the show because fuck you, Slack. Goodbye, good night, and we'll see you next week. Guys, lace their boots, guys and gals collectively. Yeah. His tattoo is perfectly positioned that for the rest of his career, you will never have to see it if he so chooses because he wears tall boots. That's true. Even if he does go to WWE and he could go out there in black tights and black boots and you still would never see that AEW tattoo because it'll be covered up by his tall boots. So even if he bet on himself for this contract in five years, he could still go to WWE and not give a shit. Yeah. It's true. Like, I'm not I'm not a dummy. I was I wasn't born <laughs> yesterday. It wasn't too long ago. Though, but like like that's the thing. Like he put it in a position where it's easily covered. For a long time, you couldn't tell I had tattoos unless I chose for you to be able to tell I had tattoos. Correct. You know, and then I reached a point where I stopped giving a shit. But now, like he did that. He made it a point. You're not gonna be able to tell he has that tattoo unless he wants you to yeah, see it. No, that's that's a good point. So the door will always be open for MJF because if he has a fantastic run, which it seems like he is he is hell bent on having a fantastic run which means his stock at the time that he does, let's say he signs a five year, you know, so by the time, what is it? 2029, 2020, 2030 rolls around. He'll be WWE ready. Very much. so. I think his next contract, he'll be in WWE by the 2030s. He'll end his career in WWE with a title yeah, there. I would agree. I, I, I wholeheartedly would agree with that. And hopefully he gets a better t-shirt treatment than what he got right now, because that is, is atrocious but ladies and gentlemen that pretty much concludes our show this week with uh mr will gray from bot spots and share shots podcast will the floor is yours what would you like to promote right about now first and foremost king ricky i want to say thank you for allowing me to be in place of uh the other will yes, the other will a very fine substitute <laughs> for this will yes um I uh, I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. If you're interested in my shenanigans elsewhere and you're listening to this, you can check my link tree anywhere you do anything on the internet at the Will Gray. And when you find that link tree, it'll take you everywhere I do everything for Botch Bots and Cheer Shots, Rivet City Radio, Off the Top Media, and my writing profile for Last Word on Sports. There you go. Pretty, pretty short, simple, and to the point. So with that being said, Will, you're going to stick around for the post show for a little bit? Yeah, I'll hang yeah out we're gonna we're gonna show. talk Absolutely. some college football on the post show. Actually, there's some fun stuff going on uh, in college football these days. So we're gonna stick around for the he's gonna stick around for the post show. But until then, folks, ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to Kings of the Rings podcast episode number three hundred and seventy-seven, a court of anarchy. Yes, just like the book, I'm kind of a bibliophile these days. I'm your host, King Ricky Rose. You can find me at Ambassador Biggs across all social media outlets. B I G Z Ambassador Biggs across uh, Facebook. Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, some people's DMs, less people's text messages, B-I-G-Z, Ambassador Biggs. Find Kings of the Rings podcast at K-O-T-R underscore podcast across all social media outlets. Like, share, subscribe, leave us five-star reviews, buy some of our fantastic merch. I got to update some of that. The link is in the description below. By the way, that merch is probably going to be the Wolf of Wrestling. Um, find, <laughs> find Wrestle Addict Radio socials at Addict underscore Wrestle on Twitter and at Wrestle Addict Radio everywhere else. Again, the link's all of that are in the description below when i come back next week hopefully i'll have one of my hosts back uh and we'll talk about whatever's going on with live and dom we're going to preview nxt battleground there might be more tna integration like we saw tonight the sky is the limit in the world of wrestling the cold war of wrestling has begun doors are being broken no doors are forbidden anymore except for door for slack to be on the show because fuck you slack goodbye Good night, and we'll see you next week.
This has been a Wrestle Attic Radio branded podcast.